Hey, it's Monday night, and we're back for another episode of EOBS. We have a super-duper special guest tonight. Carlos Alizraki is going to be here. This guy's done everything. I'm excited. You seem really excited. <laughs> I'm Com- like, you seem no, completely no, no, underwhelmed. No. I know Carlos more from television than anything because of Reno 911. Oh, I, okay. I'm super psyched about just having a cool guy like that in the audience who's going to have a lot to share uh, of his knowledge. I can't wait to talk to him and we'll learn more about juice it. Juice his head. Yes. Plus, we have tons of your questions that you've been sending in. And, of course, we're in somebody else's studio. So stay tuned. We'll be right here, right this very spot on VOBS coming up. Two men, twin sons from different mothers, with a passion for voiceover recording technology and the desire to make recording easy for voice actors everywhere. Together, in one place. George Whittem, the home studio engineer to the stars, a Virginia Tech grad with an unmatched knowledge of all the latest gear and technology in voiceover today. Dan Leonard, the home studio master, a voice actor with over 30 years experience in broadcasting and recording, and a no holds barred myth busting attitude for teaching you how easy it is. Together, to bring you all the latest technology, today's voiceover superstars, and leading the discussion on how to make the most of your voiceover business. This is VoiceOver Body Shop. VoiceOver Body Shop is brought to you by VoiceOverEssentials.com, home of Harlan Hogan Signature Products, Source Elements, makers of Source Connect, Source Connect Pro, and Source Connect Now, VO2Gogo.com, everything you need to become a successful voice artist, VoiceOver Extra, your daily resource for VO success, the VO Dojo, take your voiceover career all the way. J. Michael Collins Demos, when quality matters. And by voiceactorwebsites.com, where your voice actor website shouldn't be a pain in the butt. And now, live from their super secret multimedia studio in Sherman Oaks, California, here are George Whittem and Dan Leonard. Hey, I'm Dan Leonard. I'm still reading the checklist, Dan. Oh, wait. Uh, I'm George Whittem. And this is VoiceOver. Body Shop. Or VO. BS. Yes. In perfect Somebody unison. Somebody jumped the cue <laughs> yeah. right there. Timing is not their strong suit. This yes. is not a music show. Oh, okay. Most of the time. <laughs> well, anyway. Well, thank you for joining us here on this Monday night uh, for VoiceOver Body Shop. Our guest tonight is Carlos Alas Rocky. Mm-hmm. This guy's been on Rocco and uh, Camp Laszlo. It was Mr. Crocker on the Fairly was, Odd Parents. And he was a little chihuahua you may yeah, have yeah. seen on some yes. commercial. We'll have him do all those voices just because we'll be just totally uh, adolescent Boing. about it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, plus, we've got some tech stuff and uh, lots of great questions about some stuff. <laughs> yeah, that's what we love. Yes. We and love your tech update. Stuff. And, of course, your questions. So, let's get the show on the road here. First, it's time for... Voice Over Body Shop presents the VOBS Voice Over Extra News. All the information you need for a successful voiceover career. And here is the news. A simple business plan. Now, you probably remember our feature here a few weeks ago when voiceover pro and coach Jonathan Tilly gave us five major marketing mistakes. The things he says we should stop doing right now. Well, some of his points were not without controversy, but the article on voiceover extra has been a top draw for downloads and likes. Certainly, apparently struck a nerve or two or hundreds. (laughs) Tonight's Let's Go Two for Two with another potentially controversial concept from Jonathan. How to simplify the notion of creating a voiceover business plan. Jonathan says it's ridiculously simple. Ridiculously? I wish. And let's caution up front that his idea is not to be confused with setting goals and action plans, such as creating a demo or setting up or tweaking your home studio. In a new article on VoiceOver Extra, Jonathan first gives us what he says are three loose definitions of business plans. 
Number one, it's a document that puts together a strategy for your business. Simple enough. But then here's number two, which Jonathan calls the entrepreneurial business plan. This tells us how to build a business or company that you can sell later. Mm. And now for number three, the freelancer's business plan. This one, Jonathan says, is merely the exchange of your time to create what you do for money. You're not going to sell your company. In fact, if, there, if you're not there, there is no money. Of course, that describes you as a freelance voice actor. So Jonathan says, all you really need to do is to find dream clients who want to exchange their money for your time. A simple way to think of a business plan, right? What do you think? Well, you know, you can see more of Jonathan's logic in that article now at voiceoverextra.com, along with thousands of other articles and resources. And hey, it's all free. Your daily resource for voiceover success. Yes. Been watching something on Facebook all week with Jonathan Tilly. Yeah. And people who had some sort of a homework assignment, and they've been going nuts and posting crazy on Facebook. Well, we're going to do this. We could do this. A lot of stuff with uh, the marketing. He has a big marketing class. He is. He is a diabolical genius when it comes to that yes. kind of stuff. Yes, Anybody that tells you how to do marketing and then has you going out on the social webs yeah. to promote the fact that you're using their service. I mean, it's freaking yeah, brilliant. Right. And he's in Germany. <laughs> and he's in Germany. Do you have Go no figure. idea? He's yeah. an example an American in Germany. Working yes. from anywhere. Yes. Mm -hmm. Anyway, what's the latest in tech update? Well, I mean, there's a couple of cool things. Uh, it's been on the radar. Like we, we shot a little video of that Personas AR8 mixer when we were at NAMM. Yeah. Well, in reality, it's pretty good. It looked pretty good when we saw it. I put one in service at uh, Rick Wasserman's studio and, uh, Bottom line is he hasn't said a word. No news is good, good news. news. Yeah. When I install anything in a studio, I do not want to hear anything from the client after that. I just want them to be, be back to work. Was it, it, it had it had on off buttons. And it was just real simple to operate. As yeah, I it just has all the right bells and whistles for for what a typical voice actor who's doing live directed reads, you know, Source Connect and Skype and. All that kind of stuff. It has all the right stuff. Right. Plus, he does coaching. So he'll be outside the booth, and he has the student inside, and it has the right routing for that. It also has a cool feature of an internal recording device. So like you know, you put card. an SD card yeah. in there, and if you're just doing a really long read, you know, you're doing that hour-long dreaded phone patch, you do not want to walk out, hit stop, and have your file go poof, or have, like, little clicks and pops yeah. all the way. The built-in recorder could be a, a huge lifesaver. Yeah. So. He was really glad because that was something that he's been dealing with. Clicks and pops in the audio. We've tried all sorts of stuff in his studio, and this seems to be working beautifully. And he's on a new iMac. Not the new, new, new iMac, but maybe one generation back, and it's, it's working They're great. still good. Yeah, no, absolutely. We're, I'm using a – hey, we're both using uh, Mac minis from 2011. This is true. And, and they still work. Mine's been working beautifully. I'm very happy. It's like a Volvo 240D. <laughs> It's the Volvo 240D of Max. Max, yeah. absolutely. Um, the uh, SE, which you happen to mention, you're going to be checking out some mics from SE. SE microphones designed by Rupert Neff. Yeah, he's he's involved in somewhere along the way. But one of them is called the SE X1A. Yeah. The SE X1? Gee, yes. that's an interesting name for that. Yeah, well, I say Sexy, it's, eh? he's taking the name from the Elon Musk school of naming products. Oh, ah, okay. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you know, you know, the Model S, right? the Model X, yep. the Model 3, yeah. which was supposed to be the Model E, but Ford says you can't call it that. It was supposed to be SEX. Uh, and then the new one's going to be Model Y. The, the, the coupe. Sexy. Right. Anybody yeah. catching on? And, and then he's got that road Space sex. Going, going off to Space Mars. Space sex. Space sex. Yes. Come on. Sp Come on, people. Son of a uh, gun. <laughs> he's ridiculous. Never realized that. I love Elon Musk. He's awesome. <laughs> Anyway, the SCX1A is about a hundred bucks, and the buzz I'm seeing is, it a, is that it's a really good starter mic, and maybe not even a starter mic. It could be a mic you can last that can last you for a while. It's for that price point. It's a it's a killer deal, and it's supposed to be clean, quiet. It has a high pass filter. Some of the basic stuff you need in a in a good studio mic. Yeah. Well, I'll be the judge of that. We're gonna find out for real because there's I know that I know they're sending me one, and I'm gonna check it out and do a review of it and see if it's. You know, for a hundred bucks, you know what I always say: if it, any mic over two hundred dollars is going to do fine for you in your home Pretty studio, hundred bucks, 
Let's, Let's see, see if they can break the barrier on that. Let's see. Are they sending you anything else other than that? Uh, the, yeah, they're sending me a couple other higher end. Getting a USB one? They have a USB version mm, too. I think. No, they're not sending strictly me strictly studio, strictly like not studio USB. mics. Yeah, and cool. and also their new mud flap. All right. Which SC, of course, perfected. They with call the, it the Reflexion the Reflexion filter, filter. trademark. Yeah. Um, but, but most of them just call them a mud flap. Yeah, <laughs> a mud flap. And the last thing is like four sixteens. This isn't really news per se, but the thing is. If you have a Sennheiser 416 and you want to have a backup, the best backup is probably another 416. But I know, a grand, right? If you're, if you're really good, maybe 800 bucks. A 415T, which is a, man, 25-plus-year-old variation on the 416, yeah. goes back a ways. These things are readily available on eBay for less than 500 sometimes as low as 400 bucks. I just put one up in a studio last week. It's, it sounds fantastic. It uses a little power adapter because it uses T power. This is pr something that predates phantom power and production mixers had these things back, you know, back in the seventies, yeah. like the Nagras and right, stuff. Right. And reel to reels and yes. like grease pencils. So and it's razor old blades. tech, but with the right, a little adapter, it's, it works with phantom power and it sounds fantastic. It's a great sounding mic. And so it could be a great alternative, or maybe if you really want to buy that 416 and you just can't, scrape together the shekels yet 400 bucks for a used one buy it from a reputable dealer if you can yeah yes you can buy on ebay but if you do ebay check the reviews check to see if the, the seller is verified or if the seller you know has a actual dealership that sells gear right not a pawn shop i don't recommend buying used mics from pawn shops cheap ones some something you can take a risk on, fine, but anything without a return Maybe policy. A karaoke machine or something. Yeah, not a good not, idea. Not a good mic. Another reason to look for these used uh, 416s is there was a rash of knockoff 416s. Yeah, I was going to say. That There's... was a couple years ago. Yeah. And those are guaranteed out there in circulation. People are, I'm sure, flipping those on eBay still because they got stuck with them. They have to get rid of them. Now they're selling them. Right. So watch out for those. Um, these are not going to be knocked off because they're ain't, you know, they're vintage. Right. And most of them are in a chrome finish, right. which looks pretty cool, right. actually. Yeah. So. And the thing is, is most people don't use them for voiceover. They're video mics. Yeah. They're you might get one that looks a little bit beat up. Like the one I saw, some of the little grills were <laughs> a little crooked. A slight little bent in it. And yeah, yeah, it had CBS <laughs> etched into it with an engraver, which, you know, that's fun, right? It was the on the road is, with Charles Corral. Who knows, but the mic still stands the test of time. So Excellent. There you Alrighty. go. That's the tech news. Yes. Well. Carlos Alvarez is going to be joining us in a few minutes. Yeah. We're going to have a fun time talking to him. But we've got three questions from our vast worldwide audience that mm -hmm. were sent in this week. And we're going to cover those and uh, answer your questions. And by the way, whose studio are we in this week? I forget. Who, who, who is this guy? I don't know. Oh, Lance, something? Lance DeBach. Lance DeBach. Lance DeBach, to, yes. Yeah. He's uh, in New Jersey, I think. Is, but, you know, it looks like we're in his studio. Your studio can be on here, too. Just send it to us at theguysatvobs.tv. We got a pile of them. So it might be, you know, till summer do we get yours on, unless it's, like, really cool. The reason I have this, these pictures is because I asked him to send me the pictures. Because when he sent me the audio sample, yeah. his noise floor was so low. I was like, where are you, man? Are you out in the sticks? He's like, actually, I'm, I'm in Tom's River, New Jersey. He built a bunker, apparently. Yeah, he's like, he's near the beach. Yeah. And I was like, well, you you done good, man. Yeah, so it almost that's... looks like a radio studio with the window back there. and It's pretty cool. It is. Yeah, nice work. I'll have to go Thanks, visit Lance. him when we're out there in Tom's River, New Jersey. If you're ever at the Jersey Shore. All right. Well, we'll be right back with your stuff, your questions, and more here on Voice Over Body Shop right after this. In a world of audio, two men knew what they were doing, or at least they have you convinced. They put the BS and V-O-B-S dot TV. Having dinner tonight? How about having some VO too? Voice over body shop. Have some voice over with your dinner tonight on Voice Over Body Shop, 9 Eastern, 6 Pacific. Every Monday, 9 Eastern, 6 Pacific. Voice over body shop. I love when they talk BS about VO. Hey, will 2018 be the year you take your voiceover practice to the next level? If not, let me tell you something about VO2GoGo.com. I think there's also some leftover pizza in the fridge if you're like waiting, if you, you know, if you think that things are just going to happen for you. But 
I want you to go to a very special URL, vo2gogo.com forward slash V-O-B-S. That's vo2gogo, the number two, dot com forward slash V-O-B-S. Join the hundreds of voiceover practitioners around the world who have decided to do something positive and invest in themselves for this new year. It's getting on in the March here, so, but anyway, learn from the ground up or from where you want to be. All you have to do is go over to vo2gogo.com forward slash V-O-B-S. One more time, vo2gogo.com forward slash V-O-B-S. Hey, let's make 2018 your year. As a voice talent, you have to have a website. But what a hassle getting someone to do it for you. And when they finally do, they break or don't look right on mobile devices. They're not built for marketing and SEO. They're expensive. You have limited or no control. And it takes forever to get one built and go live. So what's the best way to get you online in no time? Go to voiceactorwebsites.com. Like our name implies, voiceactorwebsites.com just does websites for voice actors. We believe in creating fast, mobile-friendly, responsive, highly functional designs that are easy to read and easy to use. You have full control. No need to hire someone every time you want to make a change. And our upfront pricing means you know exactly what your costs are ahead of time. You can get your voiceover website going for as little as $700. So if you want your voice actor website without the hassle of complexity and dealing with too many options, go to voiceactorwebsites.com, where your VO website shouldn't be a pain in the you-know-what. And we're back on VoiceOver Body Shop. Uh, Carlos Alas Rocky going to be with us in a few minutes, but we have questions from our audience mm -hmm. on their home studio stuff. That's why we did this show in the first place. Yes. That's the whole idea. Yeah. Seven years ago. Seven years ago in the week, mm -hmm. March 22nd, 2011, we Holy started this smokes. show. If you can believe it. Anyway, but Shelly Baldiga asks, she says, I've been using a Mac mini in my studio since 2011. Just Speaking like us. Which, Recently, I'm seeing the beach ball more and more while editing, so much so that I'm starting to feel an impact on my production time. Mm -hmm. I'm looking at the entry-level iMac mid-2017 model, figuring this would be have to be faster, of course. But the specs are not very different from my current setup. Would I really see an improvement in performance just because it's newer? Do I need to go with a pricier model, or is the latest basic iMac a good buy? That's a really good question, actually. All right. When, Next when you question. Look, when you look at the specs, you're like, what the heck am I paying? Like, why? It's, it's been six years. Why do the clock speeds and nothing really seems to have changed a whole lot, right? What I has mean, Mac done? It's because they every iteration of the uh, the Intel chip, they add, you know, they add more special sauce under the hood. They add more cores. They add, well, they <laughs> add more, even, they don't even add more cores. There's just all these generations of the chip. Right. And they have all these funny names like Ivy Lake and KB Lake and all these code names. Right. But it's all done kind of behind the scenes. So you don't really know that they're improving, but they are improving. So an i7 or an i5 chip now is going to be quite a ways in, uh, advanced faster and everything else from the same exact chip model from six years ago. Yeah. So it's going to be faster for sure. But another thing that makes your Mac much, much faster whether it's six years old or brand new, is whether it has an SSD drive in it. And that I highly recommend. Very good chance that your 2011 does not have an SSD in it. Um, I don't believe in 2011 you could get one with an SSD. That's a solid state drive. And solid state drives make your computer way faster. You'll see the beach ball far, far less often. Um, that beach ball comes up when it's seeking and reading the hard drive, trying to find stuff it's looking for, or trying to find a place on the hard drive to write data, those old spinning drives and the ones that come in the Mac Mini particularly are really slow. Yeah. So I'm not saying it. I'm not quite saying it's worth investing and in upgrading your 2011. It's it's up there in age now, but that would be something that would be a very noticeable improvement in performance. So point being, if you do buy a new iMac, spend the money, get the upgrade for the SSD. Yes. It's not something you can do later in an iMac. No. These suckers, everything's soldered down in these things now. Upgrading them is very difficult can, can and expensive. can't even put more RAM in them or anything. Yeah, so get the best iMac. If you get an iMac, get the best one you can afford. You know, don't... The iMac Pro is a whole other 
stratosphere in terms of cost and performance, you don't need an iMac Pro. But get at least an iMac i5 with 16 gigs of RAM and a 512 gig of, uh, gigabyte, blah, 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 512 gigabyte SSD. That'd yeah. be a good starting specs, something that will keep you happy for at least five or six years. I would. All right, so that answers that question. All in right. too much detail. Way too much detail. But, mm -hmm. you know, Max, or detail. All right, got a question here from the one and only Rosie Amador. Mm -hmm. All the way in Boston, underneath a pile of snow, another 18 inches on top of them. She says, well, she was too sick to stay up late last Monday night, and she was literally falling asleep as she was watching the Facebook broadcast, so she didn't hear you talk about VISDN service that Source Connect is now offering. That's because I didn't. Ah, <laughs> I forgot. Oh. So you didn't miss a thing. So now's my chance to make up for it. Go for it. She's like, do you think it's worth the money and what it costs for someone that's using ISDN only twice a month? Or maybe three or four times a, a month. Is it worth going to VISDN at all? Um, you know, right now I, she's using IPDTL for ISDN bridging. <sighs> it's a good question. I, if, you're, if IPDTL is working for you and you're only using it a few times a month and it's proving to be reliable for you, it works every time, no drama. You're, you're fine. Stick, stick with it. If you're working with studios who are really, really picky about using a bridge, there's going to be clients who are just like, no bridge has to be ISDN. Then that's when you go to something like VISDN from Source Elements, the VISDN system. You're using your actual ISDN codec and your internet connection, sometimes two internet connections for reliability. And you have actual ISDN numbers that a studio can dial. So to them... It's actual ISDN. Cool. May not be worth it for you yet until you really step up your usage of ISDN. All right. Well, they're hoping to. I hope so, too. I, I'm talking to her through this morning. I'm pulling for you. Yeah. Uh, Jack DeGolia, the one and only Jack DeGolia, who's writing down every note that we say in the show mm -hmm. for the show notes, uh, says, uh, tech question. What is a multi-maximizer, and do we really need it, especially when we have an effect stack? Mm. Well, looking at this thing online, it's, it's a plug-in. It's a plug-in, right? That, it used to be a piece of gear you'd plug into your studio, and now right. it's a software plug-in. Right. Uh, so he says, I saw such a thing praised on Facebook as a vital tool for audiobook processing. Well, as we always say, don't crowdsource your home studio, yeah. especially on Facebook. Yeah. It, it, everybody has a tool that works for them. I'm not saying that you shouldn't use it, but if you already have a tool that's working and a workflow that works for you and ACX is buying your work, you don't need any new tools to play with, like the Maximizer. A Maximizer is a fancy compressor, limiter, plug-in that does a lot of stuff automatically. But I'll tell you, I can't tell you how many clients of mine have just gotten away with using that thing, uh, Levelator. Yeah. You know that Levelator thing? Yeah. You just drag and drop a file in and it spits back out another file? That, believe it or not, usually passes the ACX standards test. Drag, drop, and off you go. Wow. So, you know, it just shows you that if it's just about passing standards by ACX's standards, almost anything works for that. Yeah, but if really. you want like something customized that's dialed into your voice that sounds as good as it can possibly sound, that's where a custom stack is going to come into play. And that's when you might want to hire us because that's what we do. Right. Dan, where do they find you? They can find me at uh, homevoiceoverstudio.com uh, where I can help you out, especially if you're, you're just starting out. I can teach you the proper basics to recording. That's right. And uh, at home and how to set up a home studio. And if you have an existing home studio, you can drop by my website. The bottom of the front page, there is a specimen collection cup. Click on that. It's a Dropbox. Send me a sample of your audio. Of your audio. Of your audio. That's and why there's no mailing address yes. on there. Yes. Because you and if never they want know to get, what's going to show. I know. If they want to get a hold of George Wood. I am at georgethetech.com, and I can do things like make those stacks and audiobook mastering presets and teach you how to do all that good stuff, design studios, deal with acoustics problems, whatever, either in your face in L.A. or Denver or remotely. So let me know. I'd be happy to help. All right. Well, the reason Jack wanted it, it was like retail three forty nine. dollars It was on sale for $29. Those damn plugins, they, they keep pulling you back in. All know. right. Those give you those deals. They're hard to resist. Yes. So, again, if you got a tech question for us, Feel free to write to us at theguys at vobs.tv, and your question could be answered right here on our show. That's right. Every Monday night. So, anyway, 
Carlos Ellis Rocky is coming up right after these great messages. Stay tuned. Are you confused about how to set up and maintain a professional quality voiceover studio? No wonder. The information out there is mostly mythology. This is the best microphone to use. You have to have a preamp. You need a soundproof booth. This software is the best. Your audio must be broadcast quality. Consult with someone who knows the truth. Someone who's been there, in the trenches, doing voiceover for over 30 years. Someone with unparalleled experience with voiceover studios, who's worked with hundreds of voice actors and designed hundreds of personal studios. He knows how to teach and cares about your success. In one of the harshest environments known to voiceover, your home. Dan Leonard, the home studio master. Separate myth from fact and get a handle on your personal voiceover studio. Contact the Home Studio Master at homevoiceoverstudio.com. Drop off a specimen of your dry audio for a free analysis. All righty. Well, it's time to introduce our guest, Carlos Alizraki, who's not just the face of Deputy James Garcia on Comedy Central's hit show Reno 911 or Reno 911 the movie. He's also been a stand-up comic for over 25 years, a well-known television film actor, and one of L.A.'s top voiceover actors with hundreds of credits to his name. He's provided the voices for Rocco and Spunky on Nickelodeon's Rocco's Modern Life, Mr. Weed on Fox's The Family Guy, Laszlo on Cartoon Network's Camp Laszlo, Bane in Justin's League Doom, and Mr. Crocker on Nickelodeon's long-running series Fairly Odd Parents. Nickelodeon! Yes. One of the most famous roles was the voice of the Taco Bell Chihuahua for Taco Bell, which has been documented as one of the most well-known advertising campaigns of all time. Time. Carlos, welcome to the show. I'm the greatest of all time. I was a dog in the fog. Yeah, you get up at the bell. Chihuahuas! Yo, Tiano Kako Taco Bell. You get a fairies. How did you get something like that? That was uh, How many people auditioned for that? I really give Terry Berland credit. She was uh, directing the spot. Um, and it was one of those days, maybe a Friday at 4 o'clock, where I'm driving from the valley to the west side. Just grumbling the whole way, four words on a piece of paper. Yeah, I hate voiceover, I hate auditioning. And I got there, and I, I gave my sort of Speedy Gonzalez read, like, you can't talk about it. And she goes, you know what? Everybody's been giving me that. They've been trying that. It's not working. Why don't you just do your own voice? And I, I threw out a, you quiero talk about My parents are from Argentina, so yeah. the Spanish pronunciation came fairly easily. Sounds and then she goes, Cheech oh, Marin, actually. Yeah, you quiero taco bell. <laughs> um, and then she said, just go a little bit lower with it. Okay, you quiero taco bell. And I drove home, <laughs> wasted time, stupid. <laughs> and they said, hey, we like it. Let's make a demo. And when I got there, they said, make it, make the dog seem like this is your barrio. This is like where you live. Be really tough. Be really cool. Yo quiero taco bell. And I went, yeah, yeah, we like that. Fine. Then a week later, they said, oh, yeah, it's going to be a commercial. Great. Then two weeks later, then nah, it just spiraled out of control. It went nuts. It, and it, it was obviously helped that it played against the archetype of what we thought small little Chihuahua voices, the Speedy Gonzaleses, sounded like. And it was really a brilliant direct and direction by by Terry Berland that really got it all started. Wow! And that that ran for like like three or four years. Three and a half years. Wow! That's, that's lots really of spots. See, English, Spanish, and I was on Hollywood Squares because I was the voice of the Taco Bell dog. And Sugar Ray Leonard <laughs> talked to me. And remember at the time I was forty four years old. He goes, "Man, he goes, man, you married." No. You got kids? No. How'd you do that, man? I'm like, Sugar Ray Leonard is asking me for love advice because I'm the Taco Bell Chihuahua. You know, it was like bizarre. When did you decide you wanted to be an actor? You're from New York originally? Uh, born in Yonkers, New York, raised in Concord, California, actually, from the early 60s onward. And um, I didn't decide that I wanted to be an actor. I knew I kind of got there through a, a circum circumvented path. You know, I was a athlete and I played sports in high school and I avoided drama because I wanted to be cool and I wanted to be tough but it secretly I watched Carol Burnett and Bob Newhart and I wanted to do that and I didn't know how and then I did Mount 1983 Mount Tyler YMCA camp I started to do sketches with another guy who was a big Monty Python fan and so we did sketches for the kids and I really liked it I like like being up on stage I like performing and I let it go for a while and then I went to call uh, in college and 85 I 85, 86, I'm at Sacramento State playing soccer, running track. Again, the jock thing. 
I had a professor go, you're pretty good at voices and stuff. Why don't you try mime? And oh, I tried some mime. And he goes, why don't you try the stand-up com- comedy t- competition here at uh, Sacramento State? And I did, and I liked it. And I started performing, and then I quit because I got stage anxiety. And then I got in a duo with a guy named Mark Frazee, who's down in Alabama. And we did all these sketches. We did a... Uh, uh, Floyd the Barber being interviewed by William F. Buckley on Foreign Policy. <laughs> oh, yes, Nicaragua, Eddie. <laughs> and we did Devo singing A White Christmas on a very white Christmas. We did all, I did Ronald Reagan and all kinds of, Jimmy Carter, and all kinds of voices back then in the 80s. And then I did a stand-up comedy, and in um, 91, there was an audition for uh, Rocco's Modern Life. Joe Murray, San Jose Mercury uh, panelist, cartoonist, uh, had this project, Rocco. I knew a manager, Tracy Forrester, she knew a guy at San Francisco State. I think his name is Mark McNamara. He said, uh, you have any actor, comics you know? Yeah, this Carlos Alas Rocky does characters in his stand-up. I made a play, push, record cassette in somebody's <laughs> kitchen. I handed it in. I walked into a place, and there was Joe Murray and Nick Jennings, who's now over at uh, Cartoon Network, doing um, the new um, Powerpuff Girls, and a guy named George Maestri. It was in a garage in San Francisco. I didn't have an agent. And they didn't want an Australian. They just uh, said, try Bruno Kirby. You know, Bruno Kirby from uh, The Freshman. No Hablo Inglés. Kid Bachi to Tutti Bachi. This is big. So I did something like that. I'm a wallaby. And they're like, all right. And then um, then they said, uh, try Woody Allen. Yeah, I got a pouch. I'm a mus- marsupial and spunky no. And then I tried spunky right away. And oh, my God, they're spunky. And then uh, I did Gene Wilder for some reason. <laughs> you are not evil, you are good. <laughs> Said a give. <laughs> and they were laughing, and that kept me there. And I said, can we just try something like this? Um, and I read a vacuum manual. <laughs> and it was like, plug hole A into slot B. Make sure the unit is not on when... And they're like, hey, that sounds kind of nice. <laughs> Sent it off to Nickelodeon. They liked it. We made a pilot at a place called Poolside Studios. In 1991, behind the Mel's Diner on Lombard Street. Mel, Mel, uh, I don't think it's there anymore. Uh, Lombard and Steiner in San Francisco. And they sent it off to Nickelodeon. And I'm on the road doing stand-up comedy in Seattle. And I get a call and they said, Rocco, they're picking it up for a series. I'm like, yay! I get to get off the road! And then in 93, I won the San Francisco International Stand-Up Comedy Competition. Rocco was just picking up as a pilot. I was flying there once a week out of Oakland. And I said, let's move to L.A. And I got an agent, Arlene Thornton, and, and then uh, Rocco was doing well, and I, then I got Cat Dog. I played Wintel. Hey, Cat Dog! Oh. <laughs> and Lou and, 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 and from the Greasers. <laughs> and it really started to take off. And that's... I didn't know I wanted to be an actor, I think, until Rocco hit. I knew I wanted to be a performer and a comedian and maybe, maybe get a sitcom or be on a sketch-type show like SNL, but I didn't think it would start through voiceover acting. And there I met Charlie Adler. Tom Kenny and I always famously tell the story of, because Tom came out of stand-up, and I actually suggested him for the role of Heifer, which he nailed, of course, and he's brilliant. And the first day we went there, we were newbies, and here's Charlie Adler sitting down, sitting, just, I gotta be somewhere, let's go, give me the copy. Oh, Ed, dear. Don't talk to me that way, but... Oh, I love you, Ed. I don't love you! Rocco, get out of here! No, I got And we're like... Tom and I were like, <laughs> oh my God, we're in trouble. And we were a little nervous, but we got our feet, we got our feet under us after about 10 episodes. And we were like, we're not going to get fired. The executives like us. And we, we started to learn. And then on my second series, I work with Jim Cummings and Tom Kenny and Billy West. And I'm watching those guys work. And Dwight Fry, Dw- not Dwight Fry, uh, Dwight Schultz from uh, the A-Team. He was on the, the uh, Cat Talk as well. Maria Bamford one of her first cartoons, but I really learned and started to appreciate being an actor by watching Charlie and watching Billy and watching Tom and Doug Lawrence and, 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 and anybody I worked with. So Right. So now I had the chance to hear all this stuff while my mm-hmm. kids were riding in the back of the car. Yeah. And I never, I didn't get the chance to watch it, but I would hear it. Yes. And of course the writing was spectacular and the voice acting in it was yeah. just spectacular. You didn't really even need to see it. I mean, you could see, you know, know what the characters were doing, but it was so well written. It yeah, was... Rocco is very adult. Choky Chicken, you know, they got that past the censors. Because they wanted to call it Chubby Chicken, and that was already a legal name. So they're like, tell it just as a gag, we'll call it Choky Chicken. There's no way the network, and they, they didn't see it. <laughs> they didn't, didn't, didn't There's catch a, that one. The hotel room that Rocco rented for, that they needed for an hour, and the guy goes, overnight, you guys need this room overnight. And the, the famous... 
You know, when Rocco needed a job and he called, Oh, baby, oh, baby, oh, baby. <laughs> Rocco, dear, is that you, Mrs. Bighead? You know, Rocco is a phone sex operator holding a paddle with a monkey. We were just playing a game. Obviously, they were playing Spank the Monkey. <laughs> you know, all these things that got by the censors in the first couple of seasons. And then Nickelodeon started to go go away from the Chris Falusi movement. And Chris Falusi really was responsible with Red and Sippy for shows like Rocco and Angry Beavers to come after it and get away with adult humor. But then they started to advertise towards a different audience and um, towards kids, towards selling merchandise. And Rocco became a little bit more tame. Uh, I will say, and we'll probably get to it, that the special yeah. static cling that is coming out sometime this year in 2018, uh, where Rocco and his pals are thrust out of space in, the, in their time capsule and come back to Earth. And it's a new 21st century. It, that really returns to the subversiveness of the first two seasons. It really echoes back to the what we would probably view as the true Rocco, more adult. I'm sure you were like, what are my kids watching? But um, that was I the start. It. <laughs> yeah. It's fun to watch. Rocco is sweet. You know, he's the, he's the eye of the hurricane, you know. It could, all craziness around him. He's just like, oh, gosh, I guess we better take care of this. You know, it's a really fun. It's always my, the, the most favorite character I've ever done, my most favorite. Yeah. So. I was going to ask, who were your, your influences? You talked about, you know, watching, you know, Carol Burnett and all this yeah. other stuff. But it sounds like because of the people you've worked with, you've probably got your training working with the top guys in the business. I did. I always say my early training, my origins, my parents were from Argentina. Mis padres son argentinos. My dad was British educated from a very early age, did not have an accent. My mom still, Carlitos, you have to call me, please. I want to talk to you. And so I, I would hear her and try to mimic her. And then Kevin was my best friend growing up, and his parents were from Glasgow, Scotland. And I didn't know it. I just started to imitate him. <laughs> you know, and they had Auntie Liz, and she would talk like this. Carlos, you and Kevin, you're getting older every year. Look at you growing up. And Uncle Donny talk like this. And so I was just fascinated and drawn towards all these different stimuli. And I think that was my early training. And like, uh, like, like a lot of people that we meet in The Voice that want to be voiceover actors, D. Bradley Baker has the definitive site, uh, which answers a lot of questions. But we always say it does come down to acting. There's a lot of people that can do great voices. But the ability to pull it off the page, that stuff I learned by watching Billy and Jim and later on, uh, April Winchell and Tara Strong and Gray Delisle and Suzanne Blakesley and, and Darren Norris, all the fair. I started to learn how to become a better actor by watching them. Uh, because there was, no form, there was no formal training for me, per se, other than stand-up. And Billy West had always said, had always mentioned that somebody that's a musician or a stand-up comic has a head start because they already participate in what he called the theater of the mind where we can see it in our heads, and kids are wonderful at it. My little daughter, Austin, will take a doll and go, Oh, no, 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 no. you better get out of here. I don't want to talk to you. They, they see it, yeah. and we sort of lose that as adults, and, but somehow voiceover actors, as you know, they're, we're very young, and we still can pretend and see it in our heads, so it makes it easier for us to pull it off a storyboard and recreate it because we already see it, and, and uh, that's what was drilled into me by watching these other great actors. It's like, oh, that's how you do it. Yeah. Picture the trade. You know, Tom Kenny's a stander, and when he, he did it after, he goes, oh, Rocco! Ah! And then the, Phil, uh, Doug Lawrence would stand and do film, but turn in to wash the page, turn your hands. <laughs> and Charlie and I were sitters, because Rocco was so subdued. For me, it worked to, to sit down and go, oh, gosh, I don't know. I'm so frightened. So there were techniques I, I would learn by watching different people and what worked for me. Right. Uh, I'm starting to learn. Even today, I'll watch other actors and just go, "Wow, I, did, I never tried that." You know, I never tried to pull a voice from there. You know, so yeah. uh, we've we've had a lot of people on the show who uh, who, who are you know character actors. We've had Debbie Derryberry on. Yeah. Tom's been on the show many yeah. years ago. We're going to get him back on. Though. Yeah, uh, and uh, and they talk about how they create characters. It seems similar in how they do it, but they talk about you know drawing from somewhere and then. Adjusting. How do you create a character? Where does it come from? And yeah, you just gave a good demonstration of it. There's but. a couple I draw from. I'm doing a new, new character for a, a DreamWorks project, NDA. Can you talk about it? But obviously, the early influence of John Heaney, Kevin's dad, gave me the basis for that. And this guy's a bit of a braggart, too, and he had some of that. So, those qualities I drew from somebody in real life. 
Um, Mr. Crocker was a hybrid, and, and I give uh, credit to uh, Butch Hartman for working me with me on this idea, was Gene Wilder, a little bit of Monty Burns, created by the, the great Harry Shearer. Right. Uh, revenge is a dish best served cold. Richard Dreyfus, there's a shark in the water. It's dangerous on this boat. And Gene Wilder, set a give! And you blended them all together. It was like, Mother, there's fairies! <laughs> it had all of them. It was, a, it was a blend. And Billy West had told me early on, you can create hybrid impressions. If you don't do a great impression, it's kind of an original character. There's a character I did, uh, if you have Boomerang the app, the new Looney Tunes, I play four non-classic characters in the new Looney Tunes. One of them is Leslie P. Lillylegs. And he's my version of Jack Lemon and the Out of Towners. Oh, I'm going to call my lawyer. And it's a little bit of Joe Flynn that I learned from Billy West, but it's like, why does that rabbit always get out of the fun? I'm the nephew. Why can't I get the job? He's a little similar to Crocker, tinge of Crocker, but mostly a bad Jack Lemon. And that's what I learned. Like a bad impression is an original character. You know, if I, <laughs> if I did a bad Trump or something, you know, people, believe me, okay, believe me. But if I took it up a notch, you might believe me, okay? I don't know what's going on here, but I don't like it, all right? I'm very famous. That's an original character. So you can draw from real people, politicians, actors. Billy West suggested watching all the Turner ter classic movies. You know, the William Powell. I always try to throw William Daniels in there when I can. So funny, I have a story when I was in Spumani restaurant in the valley without looking up I'm with my wife and she was I had watched A Thousand Clowns, one of my favorite movies, Jason Robards and uh, Barry Gordon. Um, and I were a little stern on the menu here. My wife and I would like a table, by the way. I go, I go, That's William Daniels. That's gotta be William Daniels. That's William Daniels. So um, yeah, drawing on and then with Rocco is the visual stimulation. If you if you get a picture that is the, your your best sort of because we physicalize things. You know, Rocco had the teeth out to the side and the big long snout, and Winslow's like this little mouse. Hey, you cat dog! <laughs> you you kind of get into it if you have the visual cue. It's the same as the way I learned to imitate John was that upper lip never moved. Say, so, yeah, Kevin, you you better get your homework done before you're playing around all day, and that's what helped. The physicalization of your face and body helped manipulate the windpipe and the vocal cords to deliver that sound. Right. Hey, if you're just joining us, boy, have you been missing it. You've been missing it. Yeah, absolutely. Our guest is Carlos Alas Rocky, who's mm. been everything. Uh, mm. We've been talking about all these characters. If you've got a question for them, toss it in our chat room right now. And Jack Daniel is sitting there typing away, making sure that your questions are answered when we get the chance to answer those. So... How do you maintain a character? I think that's probably one of the hardest things. You know, in some of the animation work I've done, it's like you, you lose the accent or you, you can't yeah. maintain it. How do you, how do you how, what's your technique for that? This is the example that I use most of the time because I do, uh, since 2001, I've been doing sound alike. I get the honor of getting to play Mike Wazowski. And I always say, I'm not the original. Billy, uh, Billy Crystal did such an amazing job of creating this beautiful character that I got the opportunity to be the sound alike actor for all the merchandise. And, you know, I watched Forget About I, I didn't know I had it in me. And Brian Monroe says, you're a tenor. I, I don't know what that means. I don't, I'm not familiar <laughs> with music at all. He goes, no, you're right there. And I go, I don't think so. But then I started watching Forget About Paris, and I watched it over and over. <laughs> and, I'm, and I'm watching a movie, and there's a line in the movie, yeah, I don't know anything about you, but at least you can give me a hint or two. You got four brothers with bad ears. They love wrestling. And, oh, yeah. You're married! <laughs> and so when I was doing Mike Wazowski, I started, I would slip into the Muppets. I couldn't sustain it. I would be like, come on, Sully, we gotta get out of here. There's Mr. Waternoos, and I'm Kermit the Frog here. And I was like, okay, you're married, you're married, you're married. I would use a key phrase. You're married would get me right back into it. Here we go, Sully. And then when you need to drop down an octave, it's more Billy Crystal, so you go to that reference. So you have references placed in your head. For Rocco, it was, oh my, hey, <laughs> hey. If I was coming out of voice, um, one of the hardest things to do is nowadays they want you to have that character when you audition. And, uh, you know, there's times during the audition where I, where I fall out of it. But I have the confidence now to ask the director if I'm working with somebody. Go, Can you steer me back towards it? If, if you feel me slipping, steer me back towards it because then I'll get it after the years of experience. But it is the hardest thing to develop a character and then stay with it. You know, because sometimes sessions... 
uh, seasons will end and there'll be a break. I play uh, Skylar and, uh, and, Le- and Le- Lena of Avalor. Let's go, Princessa! And my call phrase there is Latin America. Because sometimes I'll go, let's go, Princessa. We have to go to Avalor. I went, <laughs> Avalor. I got a Latin America. Get that yeah, accent in there again. And he's more Latin American than East LA, but sometimes I'll drift into a ricochet. Let's go, family, honor, tradition. So I have to pull back and go, Latin America. Not, not East LA, but Latin. And you know, it, and it physically changes your voice. And it helps you get there. It helps you sustain it. Which is a great thing about not having to be on camera for that. Yes. Yeah, yes. You can't step in the middle of it. <laughs> Hail, C- Hail Caesar. Hail Caesar. Hail Caesar. There it is. <laughs> you know. Again, we're talking with Carlos Alas Rocky. Your daughter's voice acting now, too. Yeah. Is, you know. She sort of slipped into it. It's weird. I, I think it's the safest arena of acting not to become a stage parent. You know, she also does commercials, and, and she's done some on-camera auditioning as well for series. And we're really going slow at it, but yeah, it's, I think my daughter Riley, my oldest, my, and my other one is super creative. Riley saw Annie. I'd never seen Annie, and I'd swear I'd never see that or Newsies. Cut to, I have a daughter, and she loves Annie, and she loves Newsy. So maybe at 15 months old, she was singing, tomorrow, tomorrow. It just hit her. And so she plays a carton of milk on uh, Apple and Onion on Cartoon Network. She did the pilot, and she plays uh, one of the aliens on Summer Camp Island. And she's just got this weird peanuts quality to her voice. She's good at mimicking, and usually with the younger kids, there are a couple of uh, exceptional kids. Riley is very creative, but Christy Reed will direct her, and, and I tell her this happens with adults because I work with all kinds of directors. Even as adults, uh, as proven season actors, Dee Bradley Baker, all of us, you know, the director's going to have their idea of a take. You know, Dee's doing Daffy Duck, and he'll go, <laughs> you're despicable. No, 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 say it like, you're despicable. More tired, he'll go. And he'll say, he'll have to say it the way the director and the creator want it. So my daughter will mimic uh, Christy Reed. Christy Reed will stand up in the booth and say, oh my gosh, I'm so upset. And Riley will go, oh my gosh, I'm so upset. But she's able to do that. And, and that in itself is acting. You're literally acting like somebody else. Yeah, that's a cool thing about it. And it, I'm pretty proud. It's, yeah. it's pretty cool. And actually... I'll see the copy. I'll give my two cents to my wife, and we'll discuss it. I go, honey, you go in the booth with her because she's better. She just, she's like, mm-hmm. like, I do this for a living. Yeah, whatever, Dad. I'm going in the booth with Mom. <laughs> so <laughs> now you've done a lot of on-screen stuff too. Right? Yeah, we talked about Reno 911 a little yeah. bit. What was that experience like? Really wonderful because it was the closest to stand-up comedy. It wasn't having to find your mark or three-camera shoot or hit the joke. It was being able to improv all the dialogue. So we were given the A, B, and C of a situation. And sometimes not at all. You know, sometimes they would just turn the camera on and say, drive around and just improv some stuff. And one of the most enjoyable times, besides being with Cedric Yarbrough and having our chemistry, was Kenny Rogers was on an episode. The gist of the episode was he has a book signing. We think it's dangerous to take him straight to the ball. So Garcia's job is to go on a circuitous route to shake all the fans. And I, I researched a bunch of gambler movies, all the Brady Hawk stuff. I had a little notepad, and I just started, hey, man, a gambler won. You know, when you did this, and uh, you, uh, they thought you snuck out the back way, but actually you snuck out in the coffin. I thought that was really cool. And he was right there with it. And here I was, improv with Kenny Rogers, dressed like a fake cop. And you would pull out in an intersection in your fake cop car, and cars would stop. You're like, this is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I was playing cop. It was dressed up, and you know, and it was mustache acting. I didn't want the mustache, the spirit gun, to come off, so I kept my my upper lip stiff, and it really helped me to kind of be more of a, a jerk. It really <laughs> helped me to be stiff and, and not, and when I smiled, I smiled weird. It really helped the character, but it was a blast. We were just making up stuff, and shooting fake guns, <laughs> driving a fake fake cop car. It was like a teenager's dream. It was awesome. Yeah. I think it was I was I saw William Shatner talk about what what makes a successful actor and it's the ability to improv. Yes, and I would imagine that you you probably do a lot of improv. You're still taking classes in that, or you know, I think I improv every time I go into a a session. You're improvising. Um, speaking of which, and I don't want to forget about this, but stand, yeah. I'm still doing stand up comedy, and and there are times on stage where you you are improvising. You'll get influence on a bit that you've already done. I'm not actively taking classes, but Joe, John DiMaggio and I were do, working on El Tigre, the, the, in, the incomparable Jorge Gutierrez, who did Book of Life and 
many other things. It works with Guillermo del Toro. And uh, we were just, as voice actors are wont to do, we get bored and we're goofing around. He's like, I don't know what language, uh, language is okay. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. You know, he's get, like, Frankenstein, you know, John's bored. He's like, Frankenstein will whoop Dracula's ass. I'm like, hell no. Frankenstein will kick his ass because Frankenstein, he waits till Dracula sleep in the coffin and choke him to death. Oh, man. Frank and I went, man, that was funny. <laughs> and about a year later, I got Gary Anthony Williams. I got Cedric Yarbrough. I got myself. And then subsequently, I got Eric Bauza, and it's called Off the Curb. You can find it on Mondo Media or Funny or Die, or just look up Off the Curb. And it's, I play on my website, carlosalazrocky.com. Is it Off the Curb or Off the Curve? Off the Curb. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and um, it's very do the right thing. It's for African American gentlemen uh, sitting out in front of a, a, a Filipino bakery. And I play a character called uh, Edilberto. Who was named after my uh, one of my professors at Sacramento State, Edilberto Cajucam, and uh, he talks like this, and uh, he has customers, and they are always having arguments out inside, in front of the cafe, and scaring his customers away. And then later on, Eric Bowser came on and played my wife Alerta, which was one of his aunts, and of course his Filipino accent is much better than mine, but I, I'm, I'm a close second. But yeah, but we just improvise five cartoons when we did. 53 minutes of improvisation, which my wife took down and made it into three minutes. And the first episode is called Monster Talk. And we had Fred, Fred Tattashore, too. So one of my favorite lines, for example, is, Man, Frank is I will whip Dracula's that. No, Frank is I got smelly bolts in his neck where Dracula would suck it dry. <laughs> and then Fred Tattashore, gentlemen, I have to correct you. It's not Frankenstein. That's Frankenstein's monster. The monster's name is Tomas. <laughs> Tomas? <laughs> Ain't let no monster named Tomas whoop my ass. And then Gary says, Now, if there's a monster named Laser or Fligo, I'd be running from that shit. <laughs> you can't write that stuff. These guys are brilliant. It, it so now that you know, Frankenstein's name is Tomas. Tomas. Thank you, Fred Tattashore, for that brilliant riff. <laughs> I was wondering about that. Uh, anyway, uh, again, our guest is Carlos Alas Rock. If you got a question for him, put it in the chat room. Jack's there rapidly. Do we got any lots of questions there, Jack? People, I think he's saying so much information. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. People are just like completely overwhelmed. It's an avalanche. Okay. <laughs> they hypnotized. Yeah. All righty. Before we get to the you know those questions, we're going to take a break in a few minutes mm -hmm. here. But seeing as most of our audience, you know, they're they're voice actors. To you, what's the key to going into an audition? And and because you walk into this booth and you really got to be, you have to take it to another place. And how do you deliver each time? You know, I, I'm in a like a, a private friends group with Kari Walgren, D. Baker, and Suzanne Blakesley. We all watched uh, Penny Dreadful. And we all we have, we have we drink bourbon. We have discussions. And D said, "You got to know that you are a you're a, a nuclear arsenal. You are a pro, and you bring the goods. So no matter what's going on on the other side of the booth, even if they don't like what you're doing, you know you're good. And so you have to walk in with that confidence to go. I have some ideas about what I really would like to try. If the director wants me to go uh, a different way, I, I want to be prepared for that. I remember I, I just had an audition at Nickelodeon." Uh, for, a, for a series, and I had some ideas about the character. And I had a couple of backup plans, because I knew that that would happen, especially during a callback. But it's, it's being prepared, having your backup plans ready, and being flexible if you want the job. There are some situations where you just go, you know what, no, this is my best take, and, and I think this is what I want to give you. It's very rare. D, D famously tells the story about the fish in American Dad. Klaus, I think. And they wanted a French fish. And he goes, I, I, I really I apologize that I, I don't want to do that for you because that would be giving you less than my best. So let, may I try German? And it famously, in that situation, it's where it worked for him. He had the confidence to do that. But I think when you go on audition, it's having that confidence that they called you here because you're good. So you have to believe that and then be prepared. And in this latest audition, I was really prepared with three or four different takes and then I, and then I, and an idea came to me that the monkey, like Lazo, is from Brazil or South America. So it was a monkey character. So let me try something like this. You know, he's a very charismatic guy. And do something like this. Hey, what are you doing? And they loved it. I don't know if I'll get the part, but you know what? It was my best foot forward. And it was because I was prepared to yeah. go any direction. Right. Because sometimes we're locked in. We see a character go, no, this is it. He's a New Yorker. He's a first. We want somebody from the South. <laughs> you know, and, and it, it throws you. 
All righty. Well, we're going to take a break right now. We'll be right back with Carlos Alves Rocky here on VoiceOver Body Shop. Don't go away. Skittles, taste the rainbow. She has fought for those who don't have a voice. The National Zoo. <laughs> because sometimes you just need to stroke a llama. Instagram. Download it and start embarrassing your teenagers today. Resolve spot and stain. Because the dog's gonna drag his butt on the carpet. He just is. $400 million. That's what the mayor wants you to pay for a new basketball stadium. Chickens were made to be fried. Sorry, buddy. KFC. Engage the droid army with this Lego Star Wars Republic fighter tank. <laughs> what? You've never seen a girl kill a troll? GameStop. Hey, I'm the cat meme guy. Come on, you know you love cat memes. Instagram, what's your thing? Hi, it's J. Michael Collins, and these are just a few examples of the first-class demos my team and I are producing. If you'd like to have something similar, visit jmcvoiceover.com and click on the Demo Production tab to find out more. Scooter. All right, we're back. You know, talking of voiceover essentials, we've been explaining the Portabooths Plus actually qualifies as carry-on versus the copycats, the counterfeiters, and knockoffers who simply lied that their product is carry-on qualified or even light enough to carry. So this week, a very special offer for you. Save 20 bucks on the Porta Booth Plus and Travel Bag Combo. We had Debbie Derryberry showing you how to use it a couple weeks ago. Have All you guys have to do is go to voiceoveressentials.com homepage, voiceoveressentials.com, and click on the Porta Booth plus and travel bag combo link for a 20 buck discount you know and they're they're the first to know about you know we've got the spring sale coming up too. save twenty dollars on the only portable sound studio and travel bag qualified is carry-on the only one qualified for carry-on on all domestic airlines today if you want the convenience and cost savings of a carry-on recording solution it has to fit in the airlines bag sizer so make sure you get that all right Go over to voiceoveressentials.com. If you want a Portabooth Plus or Portabooth Pro, he uses actual Oralex in those things. No fake Chinese stuff. It's the real thing, and it works great. Go over to voiceoveressentials.com. Best way to do that, go to the bottom of our page here. There's a picture of Harlan Hogan talking into his Portabooth Pro, and if you click on that, it'll take you right to that website, and you'll see the Portabooth Pro and the Plus and all the other great things that he has over at voiceoveressentials.com. Thanks for being our sponsor for seven years, Harlan. We love you. We'll be right back. VoiceOver Body Shop. Learn the latest in voiceover technology. Learn how to get rid of that. VoiceOver Body Shop, 9 Eastern, 6 Pacific, on VOBS.us. You're watching VOBS.TV. I don't know why. It's crazy what they do here. I think I'm going to go somewhere else and have a cheese sandwich. Yep, this is VOBS. Proven anybody can have a show these days. Wow. This is VOBS? You're listening to VOBS. Minus f are we at minus 4 dB? We're at minus 4 dB on VOBS. Hi, this is Bill Farmer, and you are watching Voice Over Body Shop. It's great. Thanks for joining us once again for another episode of Voice Over Body Shop. VOBS is still on? Seriously? This is John Bailey, the Epic Voice, and you're watching VOBS.TV, Monday nights at 6 p.m. Pacific, 9.30 Newfoundland. Man, there's one show that I can't miss. It's called V-O-B-S. And a lot of people are like, V-O-B-S? What is that? Man, it's BS about V-O. And I love V-O. How much BS is going to be in this show? There's only one way to find out, baby. Hey. And we're back with Carlos Alizraki here on VoiceOver yes. Body Shop. Having a great time. We, we, are. we have We have a bunch of students with us tonight from uh, Exceptional Mind Studio. Who are, uh, yeah. Doing some great stuff, uh, you know, in animation and special effects over there. Yeah. Um, so, we've been talking, you're saying you, you don't really have a home studio. You've been explaining how you do auditions in your car. Do, what, do you have a home studio? My home studio is this little phone and an <laughs> MC Sure mic that actually Debbie Derryberry recommended for the road. And it really, probably most 
likely in a professional sense should be used when you're traveling and you don't have a studio and you maybe you're in a no, no, quiet hotel room, you put some pillows up, you put it above your nose. It's pretty darn good. It, it does the job. So uh, in Lake Tahoe, uh, my daughter got very sick, so I went to a laundromat, and while the clothes were in it, I had like six auditions to do. I jumped inside this car. I waited until everybody pulled out, and I did my auditions in the car with my Sure mic, and they did it right. I booked some jobs using the little M MZ Sure, the MC Sure. Mm -hmm. I've booked about seven or eight jobs using it. Yeah, I think that's the uh, uh, I'll turn on my MC Sure Yes, the MV88. The Is MV88. That right? yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. it's a good little mic. It, it yeah. they used to record. Mostly music, but it does the job. But yeah, the preferred method is I do have a proper whisper booth with the proper padding. You know, I'm looking to get a Sennheiser in there and upgrade a little bit, make it a little nicer, just to up that quality and the proper windscreen. Right. Uh, if, you, if you use the mic right, you don't actually need a windscreen. Uh, I don't use the mic right. I'm a okay, stand-up right, comic. Right, well, <laughs> you eat the mic, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, you know, after so many years doing voiceover, I still, no matter how far the chair away is, to get the, I still lean in to do the voice. And they're like, you back off? Oh, yeah. Are you but, with the guy on the award show when the mic comes up out of the floor? Like, thank you, everybody. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I am the guy. <laughs> so... Do we have any questions from our amazing studio audience? Uh, it's, well, it's okay. Well, we also have a mic in the room as well for anybody. So if anybody has a question amongst our, to... our, yeah. our voluminous audience here, it's yes, we do. It's right next to Jack over there. Um, first one's from Thomas Matchin, one of the people watching the show online tonight. He's got a couple of them lined up here. First one is, uh, does Carlos have time to make personal appearances like at the conventions? Because that would be a hoot. Yeah, as a matter of fact, I'm going to the Indiana Con, Indianapolis, uh, Indiana, um, March 29th through April 1st. A lot of great people will be there. Uh, Jess Harnell, Charlie Adler, uh, a lot of great guests will be at that one. And then July 13th through 15th, I'll be in Atlanta at the Atlanta Con. And we do a thing called Twisted Tunes through Jeff Zanini where... We'll take a, a famous script and read different characters, either, either different celebrities, like Robert De Niro, I hit things, I hit things, or, you know, Bane as Rocco. Well, first I killed the bat, then I killed the man. <laughs> spunky, don't do that, Spunky. <laughs> um, so, yeah, well, I'll be there, and I do, I'll be doing stand-up comedy with uh, a really fun, funny woman who's a writer on Conan O'Brien and my neighbor, Lori Kilmartin, and a guy named Darren Carter. If we're lucky... Our friend Kari Payton from Teen Titans and from Walking Dead. Hopefully he'll come by and, and do a little something-something. That's at Flappers in Burbank, Thursday, April 19th. So those are some of my live appearances coming up. Sounds like fun. Yeah. Woohoo! Another from Thomas. He says, have you seen or heard changes in how you do a particular character voice over the life of a project? Does the voice change Yeah, it's certainly Rocco... When I, when I went back and reviewed for when we recently did Static Cling, and we recorded, I think, a year ago, November, I want to say, and Tom, both, all of us, Tom, Doug, and Charlie, we all had to listen to our references. And man, Rocco sounded so high, and I think I'm close. I don't think I'm, I'm so weathered now that I can actually get the real Rocco, at least I really squeeze, but I find that if I have cans and my volume is good, I don't push as hard, and I can get there much easier. If I can hear myself better, I don't really... Go, go, go. Now, the hardest thing for me is to do a higher-pitched voice, especially Mike Wazowski. i got to be able to hear it. And sometimes this Gary Owen thing works. You know, you make the conic thing. You can hear yourself, <laughs> Ma'am, get out of here, Sully. It, it, it just works. Um, so, I, yeah, I find myself sometimes straining to get back to a character that I might have done more easily years ago. The Spiral of the Dragon, the original dragon. Oh, watch out for Nasty Nork. <laughs> you know, I really have to yeah, let's think about it a, a little bit. Yeah. As professional as everybody is, I mean, do you ever get people laughing on the other side of the glass and you got to hold for a second? Yeah. There's a character I did on um, on um, New Looney Tunes named Elliot. And there's a bad Sam Elliot. And uh, I always do cores. <laughs> get myself in character. So it looks like Bugs is uh, going to spend his day looking for Elmer Fudd in a Coors. <laughs> Coors. Yeah. Drill the Coors down. They just love it. <laughs> Nothing Bugs loves better than, better than a carrot and some Coors. <laughs> Stuff like that. Yeah. You never know what on the day is going to make people yeah. break up, right? Uh, I remember we used to drive Colette Sentiment crazy, Jeff Bennett and I, when we worked on Laszlo. Hey, Scoutmaster Lumpus. 
and he would do Raj Lajlo. <laughs> and he goes, uh, he goes, I sound like the guy from Canine. Oh, yes, I'm going up the country, man, don't you want to go? <laughs> and she goes, guys, guys, oh, going up the country, guys. <laughs> yeah, and oh, God, Fairly Odd Parents, Kari Walgren and Darren and Suzanne and Tara, we crack each other up. We make fun of Butch. Butch makes fun of us. We would have a blast. Yeah. Like, we'd start to do a take, and we'd like, uh, uh, oh, Mr. Tudor, hey, and the, uh, the whole room would go, no, 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 no. <laughs> Butch, can I do Cracker? You know, we'd all attack each other, so yeah. we'd crack each other up. Yeah. I mean, every laughing fits happen some of those uh, some of those shows. Yeah, Tom Kenny and I a lot on Rock are like kids in church. <laughs> we would crack up because Joe and the guys, guys, come on, please. And uh, obviously on Reno 911, it happened a lot. Uh, if you have the box set, the first season... Wendy and I are on a date. She uh, she thinks she's having a baby, so she's basically auditioning all the male people on the force to be a father. And we go out to a restaurant, and Garcia's all dressed up, and she didn't know it was coming. And I said, uh, I'll have a chicken quesadilla, vegetarian tacos, and the lady will have uh, something of less than or equal value. <laughs> <laughs> she didn't see it coming, and it took us like ten times to get it out. And, but when Niecy Nash, who's now on Claws, and when she did Getting On, when she did a character named T.T., she had the teeth in. Oh, there was two of them. They was, they was trying to get me. I would, I would have to run off camera to laugh and then run back on. <laughs> so, yeah, it happens in voiceover. It happens in on camera. She's a hilarious sure. physical actor. Like She's a very great comedy. physical comedian, oh, yeah. You want to do the next one? Don't yeah, sure. Fred North asks, Carlos, would you give me your best tip for someone who's never done characters who wants to try it? Your best tip is to record yourself. Get a camera, get your iPhone, and watch yourself do it, and see what you think. See what it sounds like. It's always weird. I'm like I'm looking at myself on camera to see Rocco come out of this, and not the animated character, which would be behind me. Um, so yeah, it's to, to maybe get a source material. Get a get a maybe get a Billy Crystal or something, or get a Gene Wilder or whatever your favorite character is on television now. That's crazy. Do it. Film yourself and then compare it to the original. See it, see what it's like. Or somebody you know in real life. Your neighbor. Hey, you get your dogs off my lawn for, for crying out loud. You and your dogs. Do your neighbor, you know. Not that way. But do <laughs> an impression of your neighbor. One of the things that drills that I've done when I've uh, guest coasted, guest coached, um, I do Voice Tracks West in Sausalito, California, is I, I did a drill, and I'm sure it's been done before, where I had... Uh, two actors go in a booth, and I would pick them randomly. And maybe one character guy was really a strong character, and one was maybe more a commercial guy, not so confident. And I'd have them read the same copy, and I'd have them watch each other. And the strong guy would go up first and go, Hey, buddy, get out of here. And the other guy would go, Hey, buddy, get out of here. And I'd go, Okay, now what I want you to do is imitate each other. You do your yeah. best version of him, yeah. and you do your best version. And it pulled two characters out of them that they weren't even thinking about. And it took them out of their heads and out, and it boosted their confidence level because they weren't trying to compete. They were like, oh, I don't have to be him. I just have to be the best version of him, which is a character I never even thought about. <laughs> and I, I really have started to do that with, with my own characters, too. Like, um, I recently auditioned for some classic characters that I know people are better than me. But, you know, I just did my best version. And if I get it, fine. And if not, that's fine. I did the best I could. But I, I had the confidence to go, yeah, I've seen it. I think I know how to do this. I'll, I'll give it a shot. Cool. Don't be afraid. Just go for it. All right. Jack Daniel has a question. Yeah. yeah. Make sure his mic is keyed up. Is it keyed up? Yep. Carlos, thank you for this. It's amazing. Um, <laughs> your audition process. Let's say you just got a new piece of copy from your manager, your your agent. Mm -hmm. uh, what would you do to break it down and get ready to you know to prepare for your audition? <sighs> so I'm really in, I'm gonna I'm a by the gut guy. I'm really instinctual. I've got copy I have to go home and read tonight, and I read it, and I know the guy. And then sometimes I'll read it and hear it back, and then, then if I'm not satisfied, then I'll really go down and lay down the research. If it's a character I really want, I will go, no, or a series, I want them all. You want all the series, but if it's like a really, really big role, I really think about, like the Nickelodeon one I recently had, I'll think about many different directions I can go, and I'll give... Uh, my agents and A, B, and C and make them all disparate, all different. Um, but I'll sit with it first, get the kids to bed, read it a couple of times, and really I'll read the other lines and understand the scene. Not just that typical, my line, my line, my line. Really, what's the other character saying? 
is set as if it's a re, uh, sort of an on-camera acting piece. Read the stage directions, because sometimes there might be a cough or a laugh that you miss. So re go over the fine details of the audition and make sure you don't miss those. And really understand the whole scene beyond your line. Because what that other person says really reflects how you're going to deliver it. Because when we're auditioning, we're only auditioning for our lines. We're not going to hear the other thing. So that's, that's the key for sure. Thank you. All righty. Tracy Reynolds, uh, he asks, have you auditioned for one character, but the producers like your audition for another character? And does that <gasps> happen much at all? Gosh, I'm trying to think. I'm sure it has. But I, I can't remember specifically. Maybe, yeah, for some of the Warner Brothers stuff on New Looney Tunes, I might have auditioned for some of the classic characters, Bugs or Daffy or Elmer. And maybe they thought they, they heard something and said, no, we got this idea for another character that you can do, which is Shameless Oshanti or Tad Taka from Australia. Um, mm -hmm. You know, uh, so I, I'm trying to think of an instance where that actually did happen. Um I know I auditioned for some characters in SpongeBob, and I ended up doing one or two episodes of SpongeBob. You ripped your pants! Ha ha! <laughs> you ripped your pants! That was you, okay? Scooter, yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah, Scooter laugh. Awesome. That was awesome. <laughs> and that's really came from a com comedian named Mike Pace, who uh, he did that in his act. I go, Mike, I I stole that laugh from you. So. Um, but yeah, I, I'm sure I just cannot think of this specific instance where that happened. But that that's a key, too, is to... I've certainly gone into an audition, auditioning for one and go, wait a minute, can you stay and read for another? So, And I just don't remember the specific instances. So that's another key, is just if you don't think you're right for another one, you can actually go to the audition and go, do you mind if I read for this? And sometimes it works out. Interesting. Good good thing to remember. Yeah, yeah exactly. Ma Maxine has a question. Yeah, this I'll one. Let you uh, do that one. Maxine Dunn um, says, and this is my girlfriend, by the way, who's out in Boulder, Colorado. Oh, yeah. She's a voice actor. She says, Do you still do sports or what do you do to stay fit? Because you you're know, in good shape. Boy, I actually, a, a former skydiver, I actually skydived in Denver, Colorado in the winter years ago. Okay. I was working at Denver Comedy Works and I brought my rig, jumped out of a Cessna 10,000 feet into pure white. It was just Whoa. beautiful and dangerous. <laughs> yeah. um, Asterisk and dangerous. I used to go to the skydiving tunnel. Now I fly at uh, Universal Studios to get the skydiving feeling again. I was playing tennis for a while. I've suffered rotator cuff injury. But I do elliptical and I do swimming now. I walk my dogs twice a day. I miss playing organized sports because I did play. I play soccer and football and baseball. And yeah. um, I might get on a little five-on-five -five recreational soccer league here coming up because my, my legs are in pretty good shape. So, But uh, mostly... I'm hoping to jump back into tennis, jump back into the iFly tunnel, and, and do my swimming and my elliptical. Very yeah. cool. Uh, John Warsham asks, Does, do you teach, or can you recommend anyone in particular to... Uh... Yeah, I have taught, um, and I teach privately, too. Um, people come into my house, or they have copy, I, I, if they have copy, I can uh, Skype or FaceTime with them and go over the copy with them. Um, Charlie Adler, I, I, I love as a teacher. Bob Bergen is very clinical, very good. Um, the, the Debbie Derryberry, I believe, teaches. She's wonderful. I've worked with her. She's wonderful. She's great. Um, Charlie, I love because he's tough love. And if you just know that Charlie loves you, he comes off as gruff and, oh, come on, just give me the copy before I choke, you, <laughs> choke the life out of you. And that means he loves you. That means he loves you. <laughs> um, um, but there's lots of wonderful teachers out there, and, and I enjoy it. I enjoy trying to get somebody to a point where they don't think they can get to. I've uh, Joey Paul has a class over at uh, 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 Bang Zoom Studios. I, I went and guest taught a class over there. And I like it because I learned something, too. You learn something by watching going, oh, I never thought of that. <laughs> it comes out of you. So yeah, I do teach. Good. Good. Dylan has a question. Mm -hmm. Where's the mic? Give Dylan the mic. Yeah. There we go. There we go. <laughs> okay. Hello. Hello. Hi there. So I stated this before, but uh, I was uh, la last year I was an intern on the uh, Nickelodeon show, The Loud House, uh -huh. and of course uh, that's that was sort of an indirect connection because you were a member of the of the uh, of Bobby and Ronnie Ann's extended family, the Casagrandes. You Casa were Grandes. Uncle Uncle Carlos Casagrande. Yeah. That was sort of a restrained character. It was sort of your voice. 
He's put way back, and he's a little bit yeah. more nerdy than yeah. me, I'd like to think. Yeah, but... But he's like, hey, did you hear about this new tidbit? Yeah. yeah. Did you so, know that if you blend vinegar and soda together... <laughs> yes, Dad, yeah. you're boring. <laughs> <laughs> so, how is it like... How is it like doing a character where you kind of have to hold back a little bit doing the, the versus doing the larger-than-life characters you tend to do? Yeah, that's a good question. Subtle acting sometimes is a, is a lot harder. Yeah, because Carlos Casagrande is like, okay, kids, I'm, I'm, we're going on a hike, and then we're going to see the museums. <laughs> um, it's hard. It's harder. I mean, when you do crackers, mother, get out of here. Oh, Denzel, you're making mommy mad. Where's my girlfriend? <laughs> <laughs> if you're used to it, that becomes easier. And then to tone it down and be subtle... It was hard to go back to Rocco because Rocco is subtle. He's really sweet. Come on, guys. We gotta, we gotta figure this out. And that was harder to turn back to that for sure. It's tough. It's difficult. I would say it's difficult. Last question from Devox. Yes, uh, he said, "Did I hear something about getting together in a workout group? What are some good exercises, especially group character work, and tips about making those meetings run well?" Are you doing workouts Workout or groups, participating uh, in them? No, not per se. I know Fred Tattashore and a couple of Paul Rugg uh, were doing things where they would improv read together, and that was sort of a workout group for them. But I think for them it's, it's playing improv games, uh, which you can look up in any book uh, on improv. Playing games or uh, having a story or creating characters on your own and improvising with them, uh, whether mm -hmm. it is four guys in front of a, a table at a Filipino bakery or whatever scenario you want, between you and your friends, create a scenario. Oh, we're in space. We're like final space. Or we're like adventure time. And I'm the king and you're the dragon. And let's pick a voice. And now let's just improvise a scene. I think it's that that sort of thing helps. It's almost like playing D&D, &D, you know, or, or playing with dolls like when you were a kid. Return to that. That will make everything go easier. I am the king and you shall not pass. Play! Please, please, Your Honor, please, if I can just get by. Don't listen to him. <laughs> you, know, you, just, you, just, you just be a kid. Yeah, it's, and that's, that's, you know, it's, it's just being fun. It was fun when I had, when my kids were small and we would, we would do little animations and stuff and it's like, just play. Yeah, yeah. it's just playing. It really is. There is obviously a professional, professionalism behind it. As we stated, being ready, doing some preparation, which allows you to play. Um, so it's both. It's, it's learning how to act and then just letting it go and playing. And it's, sometimes it's the toughest thing when you walk in and the, everybody's behind glass. You can't hear what they're saying. You just have to, like, plant your feet and, as D. Bradley Baker say, you know what? I'm good. I'm bringing, I'm bringing all my weapons with me. I, I'm going to knock it out of the park. And they may not like it. It doesn't mean you didn't do a great job. It may not be their thing. Right. Mm. You know, I've had uh, many voice actors will tell you, like, man, I nailed it. This is the best audition I've ever done. Or, oh, I stunk. Hey, you got a callback. What? Yeah. That's horrible. Yeah. Have you ever had a casting director say, that really sucked? I, every time I go in, it's like, that was great. They're, they're trying to. It's, they're always voice very encouraging. Wise, no, there was a couple yeah. of on camera <sighs> auditions that I had where, like, they were like, Ugh, I made the choice <laughs> and it was not the choice they wanted. But no, it's been rare with voiceover acting. I, I might say it to myself. I go, guys, I, I'm sorry. This one's got me flummoxed. I just don't think I got a beat on this. And they'll say, okay, all right, well, we like what you did. And, and you leave kind of frustrated. But um, no, it's very, I, I don't think it's happened maybe more than once. Good to hear. Carlos, it has been a thrill and a it's pleasure, been a pleasure having you on the show tonight and you know, telling us all about these sorts of things. Let me ask you this one last question, because I'm curious. What do you see as the future of animation? Because it's it's going crazy, you know, on the internet and stuff. Are, are, have you been doing internet stuff, or do you see it's stuff getting shorter? Or I haven't. Uh, there's a couple of creators out there. Uh, I met a couple of creators in Savannah, Georgia, that wanted a project where they needed a favor, and I said, "Yeah, I'd, I'd be happy to do a favor." I, that I think that's how. Uh, um, Breadwinner started is Eric Bauda, Bauza got together with some animators and like, can you help us make this short? But the future of animation is people taking their own uh, endeavors themselves, pr writing, producing, creating, and putting it up on their own channel. And almost like what happened with Trey Parker and, and uh, Trey Wilson. Is it Trey Parker and Matt Stone and, and Matt Parker. Stone from yeah. from um, South Park? Mm -hmm. I think returning to that model, make your own content. I see that happening a lot. I see. 
there's many more avenues that I'm auditioning for for Hulu or Amazon or Netflix. So that's uh, e even low budget features animation are happening. So uh, there's work as a doing scratch work for big feature animation. There's loop groups. I think the the future is pretty amazing. There's going to be so many different avenues. Boomerang is an app on your phone, and that's where new Looney Tunes went. Well, it's not on a network. And so see guys, it's possible. It's possible. Yeah. Yeah. Yay! Make your own content. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks for being with us. It's Thank been you great. for having me. All right. We'll be right back. And George yeah. and I will say goodbye. Right after this. Your dynamic voiceover career requires extra resources to keep moving ahead. Now there's one place where you can explore everything the voiceover industry has to offer. That place is voiceoverextra.com. Whether you're just exploring a voiceover career or a seasoned veteran ready to reach that next professional level, stay in touch with market trends, coaching, products and services while avoiding scams and other pitfalls. Voiceover Extra has hundreds of articles, free resources and training that will save you time and help you succeed. Learn from the most respected talents, coaches, and industry insiders when you join the online sessions bringing you the most current information on topics like audiobooks, auditioning, casting, home studio setup and equipment, marketing, performance techniques, and much more. It's time to hit your one-stop daily resource for voiceover success. Sign up for a free subscription to newsletters and reports and get 14 bonus reports on how to ace the voiceover audition. It's all here at voiceoverextra.com. That's voiceoverxtra.com. Hey guys, this is Tom, also known as the voice of SpongeBob SquarePants, and you want to fill your ear holes and your eye holes with Dan and George and the Audio Body Shop. Meow. Ah! Snails like it too. Before time began, there was VOBS.TV. Watch or else. You're still watching VOBS? <laughs> you Learn the latest in voiceover technology, business, and good old-fashioned acting. I really like your bracelet. It's awesome. Hey, Paul, where did you get that watch? Um, that's really cool. And a hamburger with no cheese, please. Every Monday, 9 Eastern, 6 Pacific, only... Give it a shot. Yeah. Hi, this is Carlos Alas Rocky, the voice of Rocco, and you're watching VoiceOver Body Shop. Kill. In a world of audio, two men knew what they were doing, or at least they have you convinced. They put the BS and VOBS.TV. All right, and we're back. And, uh, you know, first off, uh, our good friend Pat Sweeney is still ailing up in Toronto. We want to wish him the best and uh, say lots of prayers for him and lots of healing. He's the third nicest guy in voiceover, and we got to make sure that he gets better real soon. Next week on this very show, uh, Dan O'Day is going to be joining us, and uh, we'll be talking about his ACX Masterclass and some other stuff with audiobooks and all the other weird stuff that he does. Uh, on March 26th, uh, the uh, very talented rhino otolaryngologist, Dr. Rena Gupta from Osborne Head and Neck here in Los Angeles, will be here talking about uh, how to take care of your voice. Every time we have an, an, a rhino otolaryngologist on the show, people just listen and they're amazed by the whole thing. Uh, so that's on March 26th. We won't be here April 2nd because we need a week off after doing about 13 weeks in a row here. Feels like... <laughs> yeah, really. Uh, and then on April 9th, uh, Tim Friedlander from Soundbox LA will be here. And I'm sure what we're going to talk about. But Tim's never been sure for words, so we'll figure out what that's all about. <laughs> Who are our donors of the week, Mr. Whittem? All right. We've got another... Phalanx of donors. Have I used that word before? That's the first time I've heard. Um, <laughs> no, we've got we have people that donate on a regular subscription. Some people on a per show basis. We have donations from Tracy H. Reynolds. Um, we've got donations from William Clark. That's a new name. So very cool to see that. When we see new names, I feel great because that usually means it's because of who the guest is. So, yes, <laughs> uh, that's because Carlos is here. Thank you, Brian Roush is a subscriber. Uh, Graham Spicer, good old Graham, Andrew Kaufman, Eric Aragoni. You've heard these names many times because a lot of these people subscribe and they send us money on a regular basis. So we really, really appreciate it. Thank yeah. you, everybody. We really do. It helps some of the technology out that we have around here that works most of the time. We are going to be doing a major revamp probably on that week that we're off. 
<laughs> I think we'll be doing a major retooling of the uh, tech side of the Sledgehammer to some of this stuff. Yeah. Uh, let's see. You know, if you want to get a hold of George or I, uh, georgethetech.com and the home, home studio. Home voice over studio. That's your domain name. It's too many. Home voice over studio.com. That's where you find it. Okay. Me. Right. And you've got a new podcast, too. I do. There's the Pro Audio Suite. It's a, it's a weird hybrid of two Aussies, two Americans, and we totally geek out about voiceover gear and microphones. And there's some, trust me, it's majorly geeky. Go find it. It's Pro Audio Suite Podcast. You should be able to find it on iTunes and just about anywhere. So go take a look. Yeah, where you can also find our show as well. And, That's right. Yeah, well, this is also be a, this is also be a, turned into a podcast in case you can't watch. But you know. it's a long show, and many of you like to listen to shows that are this long. And if you're listening to the show but would like to watch the show live because you can get to interact with guests like Carlos and ask questions, you can do that every Monday night at 6 p.m. Pacific time at vobs.tv. Or on our Facebook page, Voice Over Body Shop. All righty. Uh, we have show logs. Jack the Goalie is still out there writing every word we say on the show. And when we post this to YouTube, there'll be a uh, time-coded uh, list of what we were talking about. So there's uh, that's that's a great way to make sure you can see hear what you want to hear. If maybe something Carlos said that, like, where did he say that? When did he, oh, oh, it's right there. Just fast forward to it, and it's right there. Jack, what are you trying to tell me? I, I cannot... Tell the folks, if they haven't done it, subscribe on YouTube. Oh, yes. gosh, I always forget that one. We are also on YouTube, which you should probably know by now, but we really do appreciate if you subscribe there because many people can't watch this live. So if you, if you subscribe on YouTube, you will not miss a single episode, so we appreciate that. Right. All right. Thanks, Jack. Yes. And show us your booths. You know, we're, uh, you know, George is back there. He's, to, he's in front of Lance DeBox studio. There it is right there. We want to see what your studios look like, your 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 voiceover shrines that you were building all across the Fruited Plain, and uh, you can get it on the show, and it'll be our backdrop, and it actually looks like we're there. Like it actually looks like I'm in my living room here. <laughs> anyway, uh, again, if you want to be in the studio, uh, you know, if you're gonna in your greater Los Angeles area and you're here on a Monday night, six o'clock, uh, write to us at the guys at vobs TV and say I want to be here for the show, and we'll. You know, we'll give you the secret handshake and let you in and maybe feed you something. And uh, you get to meet great guests. So that's really a lot of fun. Uh, we need to thank our sponsors like Harlan Hogan's VoiceOver Essentials. VoiceOver Extra. Source Elements. Vo to go, go VoiceActorWebsites.com. And J. Michael Collins Demos for providing an uninterrupted live stream and bandwidth. Yes. For it's not part. free, guys. we got to do something <laughs> for about For the it. most part. Yes. We need to uh, <laughs> thank, of course, Marcy for letting us be out here in the garage. Thanks, dear. <laughs> uh, our producer Catherine Curran, who books all these fantastic guests. Uh, Jack Daniel for his stellar work in the chat room this evening. That's for sure. And uh, our technical producer, uh, switcher, and Board just director. crazy person to be even be here is Susan Merlino. <laughs> Thank you, Susan. Yeah, and Jack DeGolia for the show notes, and Lee Penny for simply just being Lee Penny. Well, that's going to do it for us this week. Uh, again, this is not an easy business. We appreciate you coming in and, and trying to learn the stuff that we can teach you. And, of course, we learn stuff from you. So join us every Monday night here at 6 o'clock on Voice Over Body Shop. So, anyway, time to say goodbye. I'm Dan Leonard. And I'm George Whittem. And this is Voice Over Body Shop. Or VO. Yes. Have a great week, everybody. Bye. <laughs>